Bible says again. If you're in trouble, you need somebody to call on. Call on Jesus. Because guess what? His line is never too busy. You're always on the main line. We're going to do it like this, y'all. Let's go.
Psalm 117, Psalm 117 says, Oh, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Love him, all you people. For his mercy and kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise, praise the Lord. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless you. God, we honor you. We praise you. We magnify you. Lord, we need you more than ever before. But Lord, we need you right now, Father. We thank you for being here for us. We thank you for being all places at the same time. God, we honor you today, Father God, for you're worthy of all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. God, we thank you, Father God, for another privilege another honor to lift up your name. God, we honor you, Father God, today, Father God, in such a way that we bless your name for all that you have done, all that you will do, and what you're doing right now. God, we thank you for just being God. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for being the great God, for being the magnificent God. God, we praise you now, Father God. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your greatness. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us as we come to lift up your name. Bless us as we come, Father God, to do your will. Bless us as we come to lift your word before you. We ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us and bless our lives. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us, Father, that we will be about your business on today. And Lord, we ask you, Father God, to release us to praise you Release us to honor you. Release us to magnify you. Father God, we ask you to set us free today that we will praise your name and honor you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. More than ever before. More than
magnify him and to glorify his name. Thank God for who he is and what he has already done. Hallelujah to the Lamb. God is such an awesome and such a great God. He has given us another chance, another chance we don't deserve, another chance to be here. And I'm just grateful for it. He is, he is the Almighty. He is the Almighty God. Let me call your attention to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, only one revelation. The book of Revelation in the New Testament, the book is, is Revelation, chapter 4. If you can't find it, go to the back of the book and start turning toward the front of the book and you'll run into it. Amen. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. I want to look at verses 6 through 8. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Verses number 6 through 8. When you found it, you will discover these words. Behold the throne. Behold the throne. Behold the throne there was. Behold, before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind and behind and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. The Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. I want to talk about praising God. Praising. Praising God. Last week, we talked about trusting Jesus. And if you're going to be all that God has called you to be, you're going to have to trust Jesus. In the world in which we live today, we find ourselves in the midst of stuff. And if we're going to be delivered, if we're going to walk with God, if we're going to be all God has created us to be, we're going to have to trust Jesus. So today I want to say to you, not only do you need to trust Jesus, but you also need to praise God. Amen. I said you also need to praise God. You need to lift him. You need to, to glorify him. You need to praise God. And the reason why you need to praise God is because it does something for you when you praise him. Amen. In the midst of all that's going on around you, you need to praise God. In the midst of all the things that have, that have battered you, you need to praise God. In the midst of a pandemic, meaning that there's a disease that's ravishing the entire world, you need to praise God. And regardless of how mild-mannered your personality is, you need to praise God. Don't get to the point where you have arrived. Don't get to the point where you have come to the conclusion that your personality and your state of being is so overwhelming until your focus is on you. Yeah. When you look at the text, the focus is on no one, on no thing other than God. Right. Let me tell you, my first point to you is you, you need to make sure you keep your focus. You need to make sure you keep your focus. There are distractions around us. Children are abandoning parents and divorcing, divorcing parents. Let me tell you, keep your focus. Divorce rates in the church are just as high as divorce rates outside of the church. Keep your focus. 
Let me tell you, folk are walking away from church, apostasy, walking away from God, leaving the place that has given them all the nutrients they have. I want to say to you today, you better keep your focus. When we look at the text, we pick up in chapter 4, but when we go back to chapter 1, the apostle John is writing a letter, and he's writing it to us. He talks about the fact that he's writing it to the seven churches at Asia Minor, Minor, but it is relevant to us even in the 21st century. When you look at chapter 1, the apostle John says, I heard behind me a great voice as if it was a loud voice. I heard behind me and this voice said, whatever you hear, whatever you see, write it and put it in a book and send it to the churches. God is saying to us today that he's concerned about how the church is doing. God is concerned about the church and how the church is reacting. I know terrible things are going on, but God is most concerned about the church. So what he does is, in chapter 4, he says, I looked up and I saw an open door in heaven. He is talking about the rapture. Let me tell you, the rapture is real. And let me tell you, the rapture will take place before the tribulation takes place. Right. I know you're saying, I know, I know you're saying now, I know you're saying, it seems like we're in the tribulation right now. It seems like earthquakes are every place. It, it seems like there are wars and rumors of wars. It, it seems like people are dying by the groves every day. Yes, things are bad. But it's not the great tribulation. I'm telling you today, I'm telling you in, John, in Revelation chapter 4, the apostle John writes this story and he writes this letter and he sends it to the churches and he even sends it to the church in Houston. He even sends it to the church of the New Beginning Church. He sends this letter and he says in, in verse number 1 of chapter 4, after these things, after all this other stuff had taken place, I looked and I behold a door standing open in heaven. Yes, sir. He gives us a glimpse. He, he gives us a peek. He gives us a look of what heaven will be like. And, he, and John falls short of the what heaven going to be like because he can't even put it into words. You see, our finite mind cannot imagine the infinite God. We cannot disclose in our mind God. We cannot reveal what God is really all about. And therefore, we can't reveal what heaven is about. So the closest thing, the closest view we have to heaven is in the book of Revelation. He talks futuristically. He talks about stuff that has not happened yet. He talks about things that's going to happen later on. But you ought to be living a life right now to prepare you to how to act in the future. To prepare you for what's going to take place in the future. And you must be. you got to be. You have to be born again. <laughs> Now, being born again is not running, jumping, shouting, speaking in other tongues. These things you may choose to do, that's left up to you and the Holy Spirit. But what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. Yeah, over 2,000 years ago, he voluntarily gave his life. They took a stick, they took a tree, they took a cross, and they nailed our Lord to it. He voluntarily gave his life for sinners like you and me. Yes, sir. For people that won't do right. For people who won't act right. For people who continue to do the same old sin over and over again. Jesus voluntarily gave his life for us. Yes, he, did. he died on a skull hill called Calvary. Yes, sir. They nailed him tight. They ripped his feet. They nailed his hands tight to the cross. Yes, sir. He gave his back to the cross. Yes, he, he gave his soul, his spirit to God. He died, I tell you, on Calvary's cross. Yes, he did. You have to believe the story that Jesus Christ died over 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to be born again, if you're going to see chapter 4, you're going to have to make sure that you're born again. Yes, sir. I mean born in your soul, born in your spirit, born in your action, even born in your pocketbook. Because Jesus calls us to sanctification just like he's calling us to salvation. 
Yeah, the Sunday school lesson Brother Miles brought it out very good. And, and that's the fact that we must be a picture of who Jesus wants us to be in order for us to lead men to Christ. The whole church is about leading men to Christ. The whole church is about our personality being of such in such a way that men will see us and want to know who is that God that you serve. When he looks at chapter 4 of Revelation, John says, I saw, I saw the door open in heaven. In other words, God gives us a peek. He gives us a sneak peek preview of what's going to happen. Yeah, when I grew up, I looked at Cliff Notes, and Cliff Notes, I don't know if they have them now, Cliff Notes gives you a synopsis of what the book is all about. And so when I didn't have time to do the whole book and read the whole book, and I wanted to make sure that I had something to say, when I went to class the next day, I would read the Cliff Notes. And the cliff note will give me a, a very brief summary, chapter by chapter. Let me tell you what Revelation does, it gives us the cliff notes. It gives us just a clip. It gives us just a clip of what's going to really take place. And let me tell you, if you want to be there, if you want to go to heaven, you got to believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the dead. Yes, sir. And you must trust this story to be a part of your life. You must trust this story to get you to heaven. So John says, I looked in heaven and I saw the door of heaven open. Yes, sir. He, he saw the door open and, and God opened it so John could take a peek in it. God opened it so John could, could tell us what it's all about. And John says, I heard a voice. And the first voice I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me. Yes, sir. He says, I heard a voice. And the first voice was like a trumpet speaking to me. He says that also, he says in chapter 1, that behind him he heard a voice. And the voice says, write what you see. Let me tell you, Revelation is real. And some people have taught people, if you read the book of Revelation, you will go crazy. Well. Let me tell you, the fact of the matter is, if you don't read the book of Revelation, you're already crazy. Because the word of God doesn't run us crazy. The word of God builds us up. The word of God makes us who we are. And for those of you who study the, the daily reading this week, you, you know that, that you're on target when you study the daily reading for that leads up to Sunday school. I mean, those two guys over there, the Sunday school teachers, jump up and shout when they find out you read your daily reading. <laughs> that wasn't a real shout, but he, he, he's excited about it. Got to take him back to the to old church where, they, where, where his parents and his, and his uncles and aunties used to, used to really shout. So we need to understand, we need to understand that God has developed us in a way to prepare us for the book, for the book of Revelation. And he says, and I heard behind me like a trumpet, a voice speaking to me. When God is speaking to you, he's speaking to you. Matter of fact, if God's speaking to you, you don't need somebody else to confirm it. The, the text doesn't say that John walked around and looking at the animals on Patmos and he was walking around asking the animals, what did God say? Or was it true that God was speaking? Do you do know that John was exiled on, a, on an island called Patmos? This island was only about eight miles wide and about 10 miles long. And he was exiled there. There was no church there. There was no preacher there. There was no musicians there. There was no singers there. He heard the voice of the Lord. And let me tell you, you don't need a preacher to hear the voice of the Lord. You ought to spend time in his word so you can hear the voice of the Lord. So when you do hear the preacher, you'll be on the same account that the preacher is on. He says, I heard behind me a great trumpet. It says, come up here. I want to show you some things. Yes, sir. He calls John attention to heaven. God is trying to call our attention to heaven. In the midst of plagues, God is trying to call our attention to heaven. In the midst of sickness, God is trying to call our attention to heaven. In the midst of death, God is trying to call our attention to heaven. He says, in verse 2, he says, immediately I was in the spirit of the Lord. All right. 
In verse number one, in chapter number one, he says that I was in the spirit of the Lord on the Lord's day. And let me tell you, if you're going to hear from the Lord, you need to be in the Lord's spirit. <laughs> Not in those spirits, <laughs> but the Lord's spirit. It's only one spirit that you need to be in, and that is the spirit of the Lord. He says, come up here. I want to show you something. And he said, behold, a throne set in heaven and one set on the throne. Big capital word, one. He says, one sits on the throne. And the only one who's, who's able, the only one who has the ability is God himself. He sits on the throne. I tell you, there's good news today. When people ask me, what do you think about all this killing? What do you think about all this disease? I tell them God is yet on the throne. Yes, sir. And as long as God is on the throne, it's going to be all right. Yes, right. Whenever God's on the throne, it doesn't matter what happens. doesn't matter who votes what. doesn't matter how much sin they legislature in. God is yet on the throne. And it's just a matter of time before God calls a court case and judge those who legislates sin. He talks about the fact that, that when he looks at the throne and he who sits on the throne, he who sat there was like Jasper and saw his throne in appearance. There was a rainbow around the throne and it was looking like ember. He says, around the throne was four beastly creatures Around the throne was 24 thrones, and these 24 thrones had four beastly creatures sitting on them. These 24 thrones represent the 24 elders. He says, he says, he says in the book, he says, the 24 elders sit on the throne, and these 24 elders were sitting there. They had on white robes, they had on crowns of gold, and these crowns of gold was on their head. And from the throne proceeded lightning, thundering, voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning. And this was burning around the throne, before the throne. It says, which the seven, this seven revealed the seven seat, the seven spirits of God. And then we get to verse number six. It says, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. This sea of glass like crystal was crystal clear. Can you imagine a sea? I'm not talking about Galveston now. Can you imagine a sea that's clear and as crystal clear as crystal? Wow. Can you imagine a sea that you can see actually fish swimming in? I'm not talking about surfside. Can you imagine a sea that is crystal clear and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures? So you have 24 elders with 24 thrones, and then you have four beastly creatures. And these, remember now, keep your focus. Their focus was on the one mighty throne. You see, a throne represents a seat of power. A throne represents the seat of the potentate, and the potentate is the one who has ultimate power. So here you are with 24, you got 24 elders on 24 thrones. These elders, these 24 elders had on white robes. They had a gold crown on their heads, blue crowns on their head. And from the throne there was lightning and then there was thundering and there were voices. And, and then there were seven lamps burning, and these seven lamps represent the seven churches, and then the seven spirits of God were present, and then before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne, and around the throne, there were four living creatures, and these four living creatures, these four living creatures were full of eyes in the front and in the back, in the front and in behind. 
These four living creatures had eyes. And these eyes were in the front. These eyes were behind. Let me tell you, it was, it was, it was all around. It was, it was all around in the midst were these eyes. It is a symbol here. It is a symbol that the God we serve is an omniscient God and an all-seeing God. Let me tell you, the God we serve is an all-seeing God. Nothing gets past God. So when we sneak in the dark, God knows it. <laughs> when we go with what we go with, God sees it. <laughs> when we think the way we think, God knows it before we think it. Because he is an omniscient God. He's an all-knowing God. He's an all-seeing God. And we praise him. and We honor him. And we bless his name. So verse, verse number six says, Revelation chapter four, verse number six, it says, before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal, crystal clear. And in the midst of the throne, around the throne, there were four living creatures full of eyes in front, full of eyes in the back. They can see everything. Let me tell you, God sees everything. He saw you when you were late. He saw you before you were late. He saw you when you lied. He saw you before you lied. God knows everything. He knows what we think. He knows who's thinking about what they're going to eat when they leave here today. He knows. He knows who's saying, how long is this service going to be today? He knows. He knows whether you are focused. My first point is keep your focus and keep your focus on God. The beastly creatures had their focus on God and God alone. So keep your focus on God. Verse number seven. Verse number seven says there were four creatures. He says the first creature was like a lion. This this lion, this, this symbol of who God is really is this symbol uh, of a lion this symbol of a lion means that that it is a representation of god's omnipresence his omnipotence meaning that he is all powerful yes sir the god we serve is omnipotent meaning that he is all potent meaning that he is all powerful he is god himself he is God, and he, it represents also his majesty. The God we serve has majesty. Yes, sir. The God we serve is powerful. Stop playing with the devil. The devil has fooled you like he's almighty. He's all powerful. The devil has might. The devil can do great exports. The devil can do great miracles, but the devil is not omnipotent. He is not all powerful. He is God. So this line represents the fact that God is omnipotent, that God is all powerful, that God is all mighty, that God is mighty in his majesty. The second, the, second, the second animal you describe in verse number seven is a calf. And many theologians believe that this calf is an ox. So when you look at the ox and when you look at the calf, it is a representation of who God is and it represents the fact that God is faithful. He, he is a faithful God. This, this calf is a representation of who God is and he is the faithful God. The other thing that this cast represents, the fact that he's patient. He's a faithful God, and he's a patient God. Has he been patient with you? Has God, go on testify this morning. Has God been patient with you? He's far more patient than I am. Because some of the things you do can really throw me off, even on Sunday morning. That's some things threw me off this morning because I lack patience. But God is faithful and God is patient with us. He keeps giving us another chance. He gives us a chance over and over and over again. See, Fanny Lou Hamer back home said it like this. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. 
What she's saying is the civil rights movement is not moving the way it ought to be moving, and then the white people are not giving us opportunities that we ought to have, and they've been making us promises, and then Dr. Martin Luther King comes along and say, be, be, be true to what you put on paper. But God is faithful, meaning he does whatever he says he's going to do. And God is patient. Meaning that he put up with us and he's been putting up with me. Let me just justify since you won't testify. God has been putting up with me. God has been patient with me. Every time I say, God, I ain't going to do it anymore and I mess around and do it again, I'm reminded in my spirit, God, you've been patient with me. God, you have not snapped. See, God doesn't even have to blink an eye and we out of here. God doesn't have to speak and we are out of here. So let me just tell you, this calf, this oxen represent, this ox represents the fact that God is faithful to us. He was faithful to us this morning. Amen. Raise your hand if you deserve to be here. Raise your hand if, if God has, has, has said that you deserve to be here. And you are here because of your goodness. You are here because you've been real good. Raise your hand if you've been so good that you deserve to be breathing this morning. Let me just share with you. It's only because of God's patience. It's only because of God's grace. It's only because of God's mercy. I don't care how holy you are. It's because of God's faithfulness. It's because of God's been putting up with us. God has been, been watching us go through our little processes. And let me just stop here and tell you. There are processes we have to go through in order to get blessed. And you just got to trust the process. I, I know, I know they, they tell you that God may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. When they told me that, you know what I said? I want him to come when I want him to come. That's why I'm asking him to come right now. But he is faithful. He is patient. He gives us what we need, when we need it, the way we need it. He is faithful to us. He is patient. He is patient. The, 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 third, the third thing he talks about is the fact that there's a, there's a beastly creature that looks like the face of a man. He has a face like a man. He has a face like a man. Yeah. This, this is a, a symbol to us that means that God has all intelligence. You see, men, men have come to the conclusion that we are intelligent. If you don't believe me, ask me. If you don't believe me, we'll show you. I got a certification here, I got a degree here. I, I am intelligent. But let me tell you, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have or how many letters you have behind your name, you're still doing dumb stuff. And if you were intelligent, like God is intelligent, you wouldn't keep doing dumb stuff. You wouldn't keep fooling with the same folk that burned you last time. You wouldn't keep going the same way you went last time. And some folk got an excuse this morning. Oh, well, preacher, I was late because the train came. Well, you know that train come at, at 8.30 every Sunday. Go another way so you can make it on time. We have to understand when we are intelligent, we handle things in an intelligent way. So the face of a man means that God is an intelligent being. The Holy Spirit is an intelligent being. The Holy Spirit is not it. And the Holy Spirit doesn't hit you. He resides in you. He lives in you. Boy, that spirit hit me today and I couldn't hold it. I don't know what spirit it was. Maybe it was Jack Daniel or something. I don't know what spirit it was. But the Holy Spirit doesn't hit us. The Bible teaches that when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and he resides in us. He tells us who we are. He, he shows us the way to go. He delivers us from our sin. The Holy Spirit, he, not the Holy Spirit, it, the Holy Spirit leads God's direct and protect. And if we spent more time listening to the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be doing dumb stuff wouldn't be dealing with dumb people well, and we wouldn't be acting dumb ways 
because God, the Holy Spirit, is intelligent. The old saints had it right. He walks with me. He talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. Who wouldn't serve a God like that? Who wouldn't serve the God like that? The fourth, the fourth beastly creature he points out is the eagle. He says, the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. We know the eagle can stare the sun down and never flinch. We know the eagle can fly through a storm like no other bird can. Matter of fact, we don't see an eagle as a bird because he's different from the birds. A man had a chicken coop. Y'all know what a chicken coop is? Oh, y'all too city fried. In this chicken coop, the man had some chickens in a chicken coop. And in that chicken coop, he had, he had an unfamiliar egg. And the chickens sit on that egg. They sit on the egg, and one day the egg hatched. And that there was something strange about this chicken that had hatched because his wingspan was longer than the other chickens. His focus was different than the other chickens. When he saw eagles fly over him, he, he, he looked up at them and said, I'm going to do that one day while the chickens had their head down pecking in the ground. Eagles don't do what chickens do. So one day the man realized that the eagle was gone. He realized that this strange looking chicken was gone because the eagle saw another eagle one day and he jumped on top of the chicken coop and he soared into the air and he went on away from it. The rest of the chicken became Thanksgiving dinner. The rest of the chicken became breakfast for, for those who ate chicken. That eagle got out of here. Young people, let me just say it to you. You're an eagle. You're not a bird. You're not a chicken. You can soar higher than you are. You are different. You are special. You are different than any other bird. You, you can soar higher than anybody else. You can hate on R. R Kelly or question his character all you want to, but he did it right when he said, I believe I can fly. I believe I can soar. I believe I can kick down open doors. I believe I can fly. Young people, don't get used to being on the ground with the other chickens. Get used to sowing. Get used to flying. Get used to staring the sun head on. And get used to doing things that other birds can't do. Because you're an eagle. Young folks, you need, you need to be reminded. If you can't remind, be reminded by your parents and your grandparents, remind yourself, I'm an eagle. I'm different. Why don't you cuss like other folk? Because I'm an eagle. Right, right. Why don't you why don't you be promiscuous in your lifestyle? Because I'm an eagle. Right. Why don't you hang out with other folk and do other things that other folk do? Because I'm an eagle. I am different than anybody else. Young people, you are different. And it doesn't matter where you were born, doesn't matter who your parents are, doesn't matter if you know your daddy or not. Let me tell you, you are an eagle, you're special. God has made you different. God has put something in you that he has not put in anybody else. Even if you are a twin, even if you are a, a triplet, you are different than anybody else. Fly, eagle, fly. So, <coughs> kick down doors. Raise yourself above the, the, the mundane chores. You are an eagle, you are different. I think some senior folk in here need to know even if you don't work, even if you don't go to school, you're different. You're an eagle. You, 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 you're not like everybody else. You are different. Why are you on time all the time? Because I'm different. <laughs> Why do you love the Lord the way you do? Because I'm an eagle. Why do you carry yourself to Sunday school, to BTU, to, to Bible study, to, 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 to classes all the time to learn more about the Lord? Because I'm an eagle. And eagles get all they can while they can. And one thing that eagles know, they know that their time is limited. And because their time is limited, they have to make the best out of the opportunities they have. 
Because the window of opportunity is narrow. The window of opportunity is small. Make the best out of the window of opportunity you have now. Keep your focus. My second point to you today is maintain your faith. Yes, sir. Maintain your faith. It says, like flying eagles. This eagle is a symbol of, of God's sovereignty. This eagle is a symbol of the supreme God himself. The eagle is different. Whatever you do, keep your faith in God. Keep your focus on God. Maintain your faith in God. Yes, sir. Because you're different. If you really want to be different, if you really want to challenge the boundaries, if you really want to go to new territories, be an eagle. So make a difference. Man, because you retired now, don't just sit down and do anything. Couches, couch potatoes die early. Find you something to do. Do something for the Lord. Makes, I'm so glad that I walked in the other day and the men were busy at work. Why don't y'all clap for the men? Why don't y'all clap for the men? It's because they understand that they just can't sit down and do nothing. Because eagles can't be still. So why, every time I ask Sister Paul to come here, she tried to catch up with me. Why are you walking so fast because I'm an eagle? Now you need to become an eagle and come on. Because eagles always walk like, always talk like, always have the mannerism that they're going somewhere because they know the flying eagle represents the almighty God, the sovereignty of God. And that means that God does what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, to whom he chooses to do it, anytime he wants to do it, any way he wants to do it. Because he's sovereign and he is God. He's an eagle, I guess. He's supreme. He's above all. There's none like our God. Verse number eight says, and the four living creatures, the four beastly creatures, the four animals that we would say, each having six wings, full of eyes, around and within. Again, it means that God is omniscient. God is not only omniscient, he is also omnipresent. The psalmist says in Psalm 139 that if you go up to heaven, God is there. If you come down to earth, God is there. If you make your bed in hell, God is there. Because he's an omnipresent God, he's all places at the same time. And when you see these symbols, of these four beastly creatures, it says it has eyes around and eyes within. Meaning God sees everything. God misses no thing. You may fool the preacher, but you can't fool God. You may fool your spouse, but you can't fool God. You know, some people have come to the conclusion, they finally realized, had I known this before I married you, <laughs> See ya, deuces, don't want to be ya. If had I known now, had I known then what I know now, buddy, you can keep on walking. And let me date myself, give me 50 feet. But because God is patient, he's trying to work on you. Every time I hear Sister David, I say, Lord, you're working on me. You're developing me. You're strengthening me. And then I tell single brothers, you might as well get married so you can be strengthened too. <laughs> go ahead and get some of this. Go, go and get it. If, if I got to get kicked around, you should every now and then get kicked around with a smile too. Now somebody's going to leave here and say, Pastor David and Sister David haven't married the problem. They need, see, they didn't even wear his ring today. They haven't married the problem. I mean, they've already picked that out. I mean, okay, and Sister David's probably going to kick him out tomorrow. Raise your hands, that's what you've been saying. 
Folk, 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 folk put you on blast now. And we got text message. Somebody already said, girl, you see, he, he used to wear one ring on his hand. One, he ain't got neither one of them on today. And then, look, look at Sister Henry. She, done, she has already texted Sister Sally and told her, girl, let me tell you. Well, let me just set the story straight. I can't ride a bike with rings on. I can't exercise with rings on. Uh-huh, yeah, see that, see what I mean? That's that Louisiana talk there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, girl, let me tell you. He couldn't keep it up there in the pulpit. He had to tell us that she, she, she had a problem. She, she just kicking him around that house, girl. She's probably abusing him, too, because what he said or what he did. God is omniscient. God is all powerful. God is omnipresent. Look at what it says. It says in verse number eight, Revelation chapter two, verse number eight, it says the four beastly creatures, the four living creatures, the four living creatures had six wings. Let me stop right here because I've heard a preacher just get all jacked up on this. He preached from the book of Isaiah chapter 6, and he talks about the fact that they had six wings. The seraphims had six wings. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they covered their face. And, and with two, they did fly. And boy, in the middle of his hoop, he said, oh, I'm waiting on my wings. <laughs> seraphims have wings. Cherubims have wings. We don't need wings. Right. We don't need a helicopter. We don't need a plane because when our Lord comes back, he's going to come on a cloud and we're going to get out of here. And I said, brother, I said, brother, you know, the Bible said these are, these are seraphims that have wings. He said, well, the folk like it. You see how they were hooping and hollering? They, they liked it. So are we in the pulpit now to hear folk hoop and holler? Or are we in the pulpit to tell the people what God has to say? We ought to tell the people what God says. And if you tell the people what God says, you don't have to hoop it out. The people will begin to hoop for you because they can identify with what God says. Yeah. Yeah. All right. says text says they have six wings. And they had eyes in the front all around. They had eyes within. They, they had eyes. And then the, the last part of that verse says, and they did not rest. They did not cease. Day and night. Crying holy, holy, holy. This word holy means that it is the most holy being we can find. The word holy means that he's sacred. The word holy means that he's blameless. And we honor today, we give glory today to the blameless God. I know we blame God for sometimes taking our loved one, but he is the blameless God. I know we blame God for not making us well when we want to be well right now, right now. I mean, right now, God, come right now. And, and we can pray that prayer, too. And we ought to. We ought to ask God for what we want, when we want it. And we want to tell, we ought to tell God just what we want. Just remember, God is not a bellhop. He's not somebody that we can sit on an errand and he come back with what we want. He is the majestic God. He is the awesome God. He is the most holy God. And if we're going to call somebody holy, it ought to be God. All right. All right. So I said to you, keep your focus on God. I said if you, maintain your faith in God. And finally, put your, put your future in God. Put your future. I want to put my future in the hands of God. I want to put my future in the hands of God because God, this word, he says the holy, holy, holy. The one that is holy, the, most, the one that is most holy, the one that is sacred, we ought to honor him because he's blameless. And then he says, Lord. This word Lord in the Greek is caruso. This word caruso means master. This word, this word in the Greek means supreme one. 
This word means controller. It means the ultimate authority. So, so this word Lord is master. It is supreme one. It is the controller. It is the ultimate authority. You see, growing up, I knew God had ultimate authority. But when I walked in the house, I thought daddy had it. I mean, he act like he had it. He talked like he had it. He walked like he had it. And he never, young folk praying, daddy never told us twice what to do. He had authority. And everybody in the city knew he had authority. Daddy can walk up on us and look, and we got, we, hey brother, I see you late, man. Good game, man. We, many times we had not done anything, and many times he was just coming to watch the game, but we stopped in the middle of the game just to make sure we give God attention, just to make sure we give Daddy the attention, because what we saw in Daddy was what we were seeing God. That's why, that's why we didn't make him God. We didn't see him as God, but we saw him as the authority. And I'm telling you today, even God, still the same God, even still have ultimate authority. And we stopped for daddy out of respect. We stopped for God because he got ultimate authority. There's nothing like him. So the Lord, the word Lord means he's supreme. He's the supreme one, he's the controller, he's the master, and he has ultimate authority. Then there's the word God. The word God, theos, theos. The word, the word God means that he is the supreme deity. He's the supreme deity, he is the magistrate. He is, he is the exceeding God. So this word God, means that he's the supreme one, he is deity, he's the magistrate, he is the exceeding God all by himself. He doesn't need anybody to tell him he's God, he didn't get voted in as God, he wasn't legislated as God, he just is God. He wasn't born God, he is God. Who wouldn't serve a God like this? Finally he says, Almighty, the word almighty, again, means he's omnipotent. He's absolute. He is God almighty. He is God absolute. He's all powerful. He's God. And finally, it means he is a universal God. Men, women, boys, and girls all over this nation will come to know him as God when they admire him and see him as the all-powerful universal God. So look at what John saw. He said, this is God who was, who is, and who is to come. He's the same God. He's the God who blessed us, and he's the God who disciplines us. And he has always been God. He's always, he always will be God. He, and he is God right now. John says, who was, who is, and who is to come. He is God by himself. He doesn't need anybody to legislate him to be God. Elect him as God. Vote him in as God. He is just God. So see the picture. John is saying that there were 24 elders and four beastly creatures that was giving honor to God because he's almighty. My question to you today, will you lift up Jesus? Will you lift up the almighty God? Will you cry holy, holy, holy? Will you try, cry blameless is the almighty God? Will you call unto him in your good time as well as your bad time? Will you honor him as holy, holy, holy God? He, he's God almighty. And regardless of your personality, regardless of what you've been through, regardless of what you're going through, you ought to lift him today. You ought to praise him today. He's God all by himself. He's the holy God. Lord, we thank you. We worship you. We magnify you. We glorify you. Thank you, God, for being God. Thank you, God. He's the almighty God. And he's the same God who gave his son as a ransom for you and me. 
Jesus died over 2,000 years ago. Gave his life on a skull hill called Calvary. They buried him in Joseph's brand new tomb. But early that third day morning, he rose from the dead for sinful people like you and me. If you have not received him, this is your moment. You can get to know him. Will you join me in getting to know him even better? The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. If you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. You ought to try him. This is a critical moment. Trust Jesus and praise God. We praise him for what he has done. We praise him for what he is doing. And we praise him for what he's going to do. We thank God and we praise him for who he is. We thank him for who he was. And we thank him for who he is going to be. He is the same God. He is there when we need him. If you've never tried Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. Just bow your head and repeat after me. And invite Jesus into your life. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. Make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. And I thank you for saving my soul. Amen and thank God. There may be others who are dibbling and dabbling in sin, who have fallen short, who, who have struggled, just like I do. I and Paul, well, Paul and I would say to you today, every time I would to do good, evil is present with me. Every time I try to do what's right, Sin has a way of taunting me. And sometimes I yield. You would bow with me and I want to ask God to forgive us. And don't act like it's just me. Forgive us. Lord Jesus, we ask you now to be our Lord, to be our master, to be our controller. To be, Father God, that exceeding God that you are. Forgive us, Lord. We realize that you have all authority. We ask you to bless us. Give us strength. Give us hope. We repent. We renew. We rededicate ourselves to you. For you are the Almighty God. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. There may be others who are in between church home or looking for a church home. I recommend the New Beginning Church in Houston, South Side, South East Side, where we are a loving church that loves people to Christ. If you want to join our church, you can do so if you're present today, or you can inbox me and let me know you want to be a part of this great church in Southeast Houston. We'll be glad to have you as a part of our family. And we will welcome you to the family of faith. Father, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your word. We ask your word to fall on good soil. We ask your word, Father God, to go forth. That men, women, boys, and girls will be made to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Yeah. In our prayer time, we want to pray for 
Sister Eileen Warner. Sister Eileen Warner is 98 years old. And Sister David is trying to help push her across the line to be 100. She is Gail Willis, Gail Willis Lewis, Gail Lewis' mother who, who worked with our youth here in music. We want to pray for Sister Eileen Warner. We want to pray that God give her strength and build her back up. We're going to pray for Sister Carol Lovelady's family and the loss of her mother and her brother. We're going to lift that family before the Lord to love Carol Lovelady and her family. Carol Lovelady is Pastor Lovelady's wife. We're going to lift their family before the Lord. We'll pray for Brother Vince Kathy. Brother Vince Kathy is in the hospital. This is Sister Davis' cousin. He's very sick and he needs our prayers. We want to lift them in prayer as we go before the Lord. It is now offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. It is time to give to the Lord. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand all the way in the air so you'll be served. The white and blue envelopes are for tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. And the white and red envelopes are for a pastor's love offering. Raise your hand if you need an envelope and you will be served. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving to Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your offering to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Let me have it, sir. 
Let me take a look at it right quick. Everybody else should have their progress report or report card in. I have one of the part of students, but I don't have the other part of students. turned in your report cards, have not turned in uh, your progress report, please send them to Sister Davis. You can email them. You can text them. What else we got out there now? We can do whatever. Get them to Sister Davis so we can uh, announce them and, and pray with you and pray for you. We're so glad that we have young people who are, are doing well in school. Amen. Eagles do well in school. Chickens stay on the ground and become turkey. Raven, salads, we meet in. So we're glad to have eagles, eagles, eagles in the house. Let's continue to pray for our sick and our bereaved. We want to continue to, to lift up Brother Nicholas Wynn. We want to lift that family before you. We want to continue to, to pray God's, God's will in their lives. Are we said to be dismissed? Unto him the only wise and only true God, 
Unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Amen.